Bursitis and cysts, you can pretty much get these anywhere in the joint. Um, you can get, uh, uh, they can be chronic, they can be acute. Uh, Prepatellar bursitis, like I mentioned in before, you have swelling over the anterior aspect of the kneecap. Usually you see these in patients that work on their knees or you people have patients that are laborers or get on their knees when they're putting, laying down floor um, or tile. They'll have a lot of prepatellar bursitis. Prepatellar bursitis is uh, overuse of the patella tendon, so it's a little bit lower than the kneecap where they have some swelling and pain. Um, swelling of the popliteal fossa, which is posteriorly, you can have a baker cyst, and all that, that is is just swelling. When patients get swelling in the joints, some patients it's pretty obvious. You see it in the front of the knee, it's just very swollen, looks like a cantaloupe. Other patients, you look at their knees, not very swollen, but you feel the back of their knee, and there's a balloon in the back of their knee. That's a baker cyst. It's a benign cyst. Usually goes up and down with the amount of fluid and inflammation that you have in the joint. So when a patient hears that they have a baker cyst, a lot of them get really worried and upset. They think it's something serious. A lot of times it just, it just will go away once the inflammation is addressed. Um, I've only had to take out one baker cyst in my entire career and it was large enough that it compressed the nerve vascular bundle in the back of the leg. I'll show you a picture of it, but it's very rare that you have to take any of these out. Okay. Um, so you always want to eliminate the cause of the bursitis or the cyst formation with ice, compression, elevation, anti-inflammatory, sometimes injection. Aspiration can also be helpful and a very, very rarely a cyst excision. This here is the Baker cyst I was talking about. It's the MRI here looking at the basically posterior aspect of the knee. This is the, or the, the calf region. This is the cyst here. The neurovascular structures were back here, so it started compressing on them. The patient started developing neuro, neurologic symptoms and vascular symptoms. So this is the cyst after we took it out. So it was actually a pretty good size uh, cyst. Patella injuries, such things as a patella fracture. You can have a, uh, it can usually occur direct or indirect. Um, sometimes they can get it actually from the patella, actually avulsing, or the patella tendon avulsing off the patella itself, or the quad tendon avulsing off the patella itself, or they can have a direct uh, impact type of injury with patella fractures. Usually the patient will have a lot of swelling in the joint, hemorrhage in the joint. Um, indirect fractures can cause capsular tearing or separation of bone fragments, possible quad tendon tearing as well. Um, little bone separation if it's a direct injury, if they fell on their knee, sometimes it's just a little mild crack, they won't have a displacement. But if it's a pretty good traumatic injury, sometimes they'll have a significant displacement. X-ray is always necessary to confirm the findings. Ice and splinting if fractures uh, suspected and always refer out uh, just to determine if surgery is indicated at that time. This is just a, a, an example of a patient I had here. This patient actually had a, uh, you can have two types, or a couple types of fractures, but to tell you, you can have a transverse fracture, which is very unstable because you've got the quad tendon pulling up top, the patella tendon pulling down below, and that, that patella is going to basically pull apart. They don't have a quad, they don't have an extensor mechanism, they can't lift their leg up because they don't have the leverage to do that because there's a detachment or break in the, in the patella. Those need, those need surgery, um, uh, pretty much all of them, if it's transverse. Now these uh, longitudinal fractures, are a little less likely to need surgery. If it's non-displaced, you can actually get by with treating them in a splint or a cast as long as it doesn't move. But if you do have some step off, such as here, to minimize the risk of arthritis, sometimes we have to fix them. So I fix this patient arthroscopically. I just go in there and look at the joint. There's the fracture there, the kneecap. So I just basically put some screws across it uh, from percutaneously and compress that fracture, and this is after uh, reducing it. So uh, that really minimizes their risk of arthritis if you can do that. Patella subluxation or dislocations, uh, usually secondary to a cutting, twisting movement um, at the knee. Quadriceps pulls the patella out of the alignment. Uh, some athletes are predisposed to the injury, like I talked to you about before. High Q angles, um, the patients that have any kind of abnormal uh, retroversion or torsion in their legs uh, may be a higher predisposition for uh, kneecap dislocations. Repetitive subluxation imposes stress to the medial restraints. I mean, if you keep on having dislocations, the structures that hold that kneecap in place medially on the inside of the knee, the medial patellofemoral ligament becomes stretched out and it can, it, sometimes it can heal like that and then they end up recurrently dislocating constantly. Um, so signs and symptoms. Uh, with subluxation, pain and swelling, a lot of times I'll have pain with subluxation, restricted range of motion, palpable tenderness over the medial aspect of the knee, 
and dislocations usually result in a total loss of uh, function. Management, if the kneecap is dislocated, you got to pop it back in the joint, okay? A lot of patients know how to do this, but, uh, but if you don't know how to do this, then you got to get it to a doctor that can pop it back in the joint. Reduction is performed by flexing the hip and moving the patella medially uh, while slowly extending the knee because they're going to be bending that knee with that kneecap out of, out of joint, so you got to slowly extend the knee while flexing the hip. Following reduction, if you can get it back in place, you put them in an immobilizer for at least about four weeks. Sometimes they can actually scar into place and actually stabilize that kneecap, especially if this is the first time dislocator. If this patient's been dislocating seven, eight times a month, they're not gonna, they're not gonna get, a, um, get a good result with just a, a bracing. So that, at that point, you probably wanna get an MRI and look, see if they have any loose bodies in the joint, see if that ligament's detached. So an MRI would be indicated. Um, after mobilization period, if you do have a primary or acute dislocation, you can put them in a horseshoe pad brace with elastic wrap. Horseshoe pad brace, all it is is a kind of a U-shaped brace. That, it's called a lateral J brace also. It kind of holds that kneecap in position. Rehab focuses on the muscles around the knee to help stabilize the kneecap. Um, sometimes you have to do possible surgery to release tight structures on the lateral aspect on the outside of the knee and then tighten up the medial aspect. Um, but that, that's something that we'd have to uh, evaluate the patient for. Okay. Fat pad injuries, uh, a lot of times this is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. We've ruled everything out. We don't know where the pain's coming from. A lot of times they can have pain uh, secondary to some scarring within the fat pad itself, inferior to the patella. Um, usually done, uh, you see this in patients that are doing a lot of chronic kneeling um, and uh, they can get some inflammation in that area get some hemorrhaging and swelling in the fat pad region. Uh, like I mentioned before, scarring calcification can occur. It usually occurs below the patella ligament during knee extension. Um, stiffness, swelling, and weakness are usually what the patient present with. Uh, the way you treat this is really just conservative rest from irritating activities until inflammation has subsided. Um, using cold uh, or uh, using cooling or uh, cryokinetic therapy. Uh, hyperextension taping to prevent full extension or occasionally an injection. Injections, you can be careful with the injection just because you don't want to inject anything near tendons because that can risk a, uh, uh, you have a higher risk of tendon rupture. If you put any kind of steroid or lidocaine marking near tendons, so you've got to be very, very careful if, the, if this patient needs an injection. Chondromalacia patella, see a lot of this, okay? All that this means is that there's a little bit of softening or deterioration underneath the kneecap. So patients that come in and say, my kneecap pops, clicks, and crunches. Well, do you have any pain? No. Okay. Well, if it doesn't hurt you, you know, that just means you have a little softening of the cartilage underneath there. Um, now, if they have pain, then it can be due to an abnormal uh, alignment or a weakening of the quadriceps. And so it's good to get them into some sort of thera therapy sessions to build the quadriceps up, particularly the BMO. Sometimes it could just be due to... Uh, uh, we see more patients that have flat feet because their feet end up actually pronating, bringing their knees together, and actually creating more irritation across the kneecap as well. So you can actually evaluate the patient's feet, see if they need something like an orthotic, give them some arch support, as well as look at their quadriceps to see if they need some sort of rehabilitation for the quadriceps to help that kneecap trap, track in a better position. So the treatment typically, uh, anti-inflammatories, isometrics, quad strengthenings, orthotics. Surgery is very rarely indicated, but occasionally we go in there to smooth the cartilage down like we showed you in the video. Sometimes a lateral release is indicated where I actually release the tight structures on the lateral aspect of the knee. That's only if the kneecap is tilted or, um, or it's impinging on the lateral uh, trochlea. And that, that's what this is describing here. If you have a kneecap that is tilted on x-ray, rubbing up against this lateral femoral condyle, it's called patellofemoral stress syndrome. And uh, this just means that the kneecap is rubbing up against that, uh, uh, that chondral surface, causing pain and inflammation. Uh, tenderness in the lateral facet of the kneecap. Swelling as well. Um, dull ache in the center of the knee. Patellar compression will elicit the pain. Sometimes we can correct the imbalances just with strength and flexibility. McConnell taping, where you actually use these taping techniques to help the kneecap track in a better position. Or we can do the lateral release, like we mentioned before, to help balance the knee out in a better position. Apophysitis, these are in kids. You can see these in pain patients that don't have closed growth plates yet. They're still doing a lot of activities, but they come in, they can't bend their knee, can't extend their knee, they've got severe pain, they don't have a history of injury, 
they just the parents bring him in and say well Johnny can't you know run like he did yesterday he has a lot of pain and swelling so they think the worst they think there's some ligament injury or, or what have you or a meniscus but actually it's just you know maybe he had a growth spurt and he's got an apophysitis which is an inflammation of his growth plate usually what happens is that the bony structures are basically outgrowing the muscular tendinous structures so the muscular tendinous structures basically are playing catch up and sometimes they put a lot of overdue stress at their insertion sites. So this is basically Oscar Schlatter's, which is, occurs right at the tibial tubercle. This is uh, Larson Johansson disease, which occurs at the inferior aspect of the patella. Those are the most common places you're going to see it. If they have them chronically, sometimes, very rarely, you can have an avulsion or a fracture through that growth plate, but it's very rare. You treat this conservatively. You actually just um, modify the patient's activities. Uh, treat them with anti-inflammatories, make sure they're doing adequate stretching activities because a lot of these kids, because they grow so fast, they have tight hamstrings, so that changes their running mechanics a little bit. So they're overloading the front of the knee. So you gotta, all you got to do is really rest them and stretch out those hamstrings. Okay, really make sure they got a good stretching program. But this is what it looks like here, Osgood Slaughters. There's where the patella tendon inserts right here. This is the open growth plate. And this can start getting fragmented or look, a very, ab look very abnormal. And that means they got an apophysitis. Um, like I mentioned before, these are the signs and symptoms, point tenderness, pain with kneeling, jumping, and running, uh, management, reduce the stressful activity until the union occurs. Unfortunately, these kids keep on getting these problems as they play their sports until their growth plates shut down. Okay? So you just make sure that they, the parents understand if they're hurting, take a break, let the pain go away, let the swelling go away, then they can back, get back to their sports and activities. Possible casting, if you have a patient that's just not compliant, Sometimes we have to break out the cast sometimes, but that's very rare. Isometrics, uh, once I said, like I said before, strengthening as well as stretching are key, is key. Patella tendon, patella tendonitis, jumpers or kicker's knee. Usually you see this in a lot of martial arts uh, patients that come through or basketball players. Jumping, kid and kicking places a tremendous amount of stress and strain on the quadriceps and the patella tendon. Uh, usually they get point tenderness along either of these uh, tendons. There are three phases that you can that it can, can, can occur. It can occur after activity, during, and after activity, or during and after, and may become constant or chronic. So you want to really treat it before it becomes chronic and constant. Ice, phonophoresis, ionophoresis, ultrasound, heat, exercise, patella tendon bracing, and transverse uh, friction massage. This is the most common patella tendon brace we use to kind of unload that tendon to let it heal. This is what it looks like on MRI normal tendon fibers here inserting at the inferior pole of the patella. You can see that white area. This is actually degenerative tearing of that intracentral third of the patella tendon that, that become, can be actually very painful for those patients. Sometimes we actually have to go in there and remove that portion if not. Most patients get better with conservative treatment. Uh, patella tendon rupture. This is, uh, you're going to know this patient when they come in because it's a pretty obvious uh, finding. Uh, usually occurs when a, with a a sudden powerful quadriceps contraction. Um, usually the patient will have an undergoing underlying tendonitis which weakens the tendon and that's why they rupture. Um, usually occurs at the point of attachment. These patients will not be able to lift their leg up because they'll have a detached extensor mechanism. They'll have a palpable defect so you push on the patella tendon and it's just mushy and you feel a defect. Uh, they have significant pain and swelling. At this point surgery is indeed indicated. Um, you can usually avoid this by taking care of these patients that have the tendonitis early, making sure they're doing their stretching, treating the jumper's knee, uh, using the anti-inflammatories, trying to minimize any kind of t tendon degeneration from occurring in the first place. Um, yeah, this is what I mentioned before, steroids, you want to avoid those at all costs regarding tendons. Runner's knee, cyclist's knee, uh, usually due to repetitive overuse conditions, uh, usually from malalignment of the knees occasionally. Uh, IT band syndrome is very, very common, particularly in runners and cyclists. Usually irritation at the IT band insertion. It can occur proximally up in the hip region or distally. So it can occur at the is, uh, iliac wing where it starts or down distally where it inserts at the tibia. You can also have pessanserine tendonitis or bursitis. That's on the medial side of the knee, right around that duck's foot area. You have a little uh, bursa there that can get uh, irritated. Uh, a lot of times this can be corrected with just correcting the malalignment with correct orthotics or bracing, ice, anti-inflammatories, 
uh, stretching. Um, a lot of these are, are just treated non-optively across the board. So in conclusion, uh, the goals of managing sports injuries, you want to make sure you do our thorough history and physical exam. You want to make sure you do the prompt treatment, you know, recognize the mechanism of injury, um, you know, uh, make sure you get adequate history, do a good physical exam and determine if further tests are necessary, such as an MRI uh, or an x-ray or an EMG, and then determine if something needs to be done, patient needs to be referred out, or is it something that you can rehabilitate uh, on your own and just uh, let it heal up. Um, early return to activity without a risk of re-injury is the goal, uh, and we always want to make sure that your patients understand everything uh, every little point uh, of uh, intervention, they want to, you need to make sure they understand why you're doing it and uh, what the outcome is, because uh, that's going to be key with prevention, maintenance, and compliance with your patients. So that's basically it. I know it's been long, um, but I, I want to try to cover everything regarding the knee. Just make sure you guys are comfortable with it.